first off do the intros for any of you who have not attended our monthly Wednesday Lunch and Learns. This has been a labor of love that uh, my good friend and fellow coach Amber and I came up with. This was uh, around March of last year, right? Sort of at the onset of COVID. Um, so by way of introducing myself, um, Michelle Brown, I'm an executive coach, my company Into Action Coaching. We kind of position ourselves as people strategists. I'm a self-professed empowerment activist. Um, love what I do, the opportunity that I get to support professionals in helping them you know, cre create a career that's, I call it by design and not by default. Um, so that's my story and uh, glad to be seeing so many familiar faces here on a Wednesday afternoon. Amber? Doesn't it, it just, it brings me joy to get to connect with everybody, at least on this Wednesday. We know we get to see some familiar faces and have some good conversation. So hi, everybody. I am Amber Lee Forrester. I am a self-help expert and life and business coach. My company is Quartz Wellness Collective, like Quartz the Crystal Wellness Collective. And I, I am very passionate about helping to equip people to self-empowering them to live their best lives, to reach their highest potential. And so that is the fuel behind the work that I do with individuals, organizations, and schools. I'm also a positive education specialist and consultant, and I create enhanced SEL programs for schools, train the teachers, and create workshops so that the parents get the same understanding of social and emotional learning that the children are getting in the schools. So we bring all of that into our Purpose Driven Professional Lunch and Learns that we're doing. And so our purpose here is to enrich you, not just personally, but also professionally with concepts and with the discussions that we have, that you're able to take something back into your work, into your home life and, uh, and improve on your life or to expand on your life or, or to cultivate things that you've been working on or even to get a fresh start if it's something that, that we introduced that may be somewhat new to you. So today we're talking about a return to love and Michelle's gonna kick us off in our discussion around A Course in Miracles. And this is yeah. part of our three-part series. Yeah, so, so again, just to kind of familiarize so many of you who may be joining us for the first time, we decided for 2021 to do a little bit of pivoting um, in the sense that, you know, we take a myriad of topics um, and, you know, kind of create um, concepts that we bring to you, but most importantly, we really want this hour to be interactive and participatory. Um, so, you know, we've got some questions and some thought starters that uh, we want to hear from you. So this first quarter for January, February, and March, we decided, given all of the surreal conditions that we've had to go through in 2020, that there was no better um, book or, or principle to kind of get us kicked off in the right direction, but A Course in Miracles. For any of you who haven't, you know, dived into that, uh, that book, that sort of consciousness, um, we really uh, encourage you to. But we're taking excerpts from not only A Course in Miracles, but also today's conversation, as Amber made reference, is um, looking at even Marian Williamson, who many of you know as a spiritual thought leader, her book, I think it was one of her first books, A Return to Love. So, you know, we want to apply those best practices and principles to how we can create miracles in our lives, both from a professional as well as a personal perspective. And when we think about miracles, this is what we talked about a bit in January. You know, we have sort of this, this perspective that a miracle, you know, is what happened thousands of years ago when Moses parted the sea and turned, you know, um, water into wine. But miracles can be so subtle um, in terms of, you know, how we can change our perspective, our paradigms, because that's really what we want to do in order to again, return to love. So I've got a series of slides. I, I don't know about you, but I'm a very visual person. And I thought that we can lead this conversation and sh Amber and I can kind of share some of these principles and thoughts with you vis uh, visually. So bear with me while I share my screen. And tell me when... Does everybody see... Yes. The first slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
as Amber made reference, you know, it's a return to love. What we want to do in terms of creating miracles for ourselves is improving ourselves as well as our relationship. Everything sort of starts, it's always an inside job. So this first concept is talking about enlightenment. Um, the path to enlightenment begins with self-awareness. So much of the work I know that Amber does as a positive psychology practitioner and myself as a coach is steeped in emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence, the very basic premise is becoming aware of our thoughts, becoming so present to where we're no longer moving through life on sort of automatic pilot. We want to get to the point where, you know, we recognize our thoughts as we're thinking them. I mean, sometimes it is so uh, distracting. We can get kind of caught up and not even be aware of what thoughts we're thinking. So again, bringing it back to our topic of conversation, a return to love, it says here, the meaning you give an event is the belief that attracted it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it, but what we want to express is when we want to go through life, recognizing that love is the ultimate emotion or vibration that we want to experience, it takes a concerted and committed effort to ensure that the meaning that we're giving things is based in love. Let me give you an example. I was, um, I had to go shopping on Monday right before um, the storm hit. And people on the checkout line were kind of complaining about, oh, I hate snow, it's just a nuisance. And as I was observing and witnessing these conversations, I realized we have a judgment and an opinion and we give meaning to weather. Like, you know, we're so accustomed to applying a thought. So, you know, I realized it's just snow people, it, but we'll say, oh, I hate the snow. Well, that's not loving, you know, that, that's not putting ourselves in kind of the right emotional state. So it's things as subtle as what opinions or judgments or evaluations we give, what meaning we give to things that can either take us away from love or plunk us, you know, smack dead in the middle of it. You know, I love Albert Einstein, you know, I just remember when I was in high school, one of my favorite subjects was physics. Um, and this particular quote, <clears throat> everything is energy and that's all there is to it. Match the frequency to the reality you want and you cannot help but get, the re get that reality. It can be no other way. This is not philosophy, this is physics. So, you know, it boils down to, when we think about love, it's easy to comprehend that emotion when we're in love with someone else, or we really experience, you know, the affection and the harmony that comes along with an event or a relationship that brings us joy. But the miracle is in situations or circumstances where they may feel unfavorable, because if we don't learn how to shift our perspective or give it a different meaning, we will stay in that frustration, overwhelm, you know, dislike, all those unfavorable emotions. So um, this is how we create miracles. This is how we enhance our consciousness level and become more aware simply by recognizing, you know, what our emotional state is. Michelle, I just want to add to that. Um, that. I love how in A Course in Miracles, it says we can create miracles or we can create grievances and the choice is ours. And so just what you said just gives uh, such a, a great example of that. Absolutely. You know, we as spiritual beings have an, a human experience. We forget that, you know, we say we're human beings and we are to a certain extent because we're here on this earth plane. But at the end of the day, to Amber's point, we have the power of choice. We have the power of discernment to be able to look at things and situations and experiences and choose how we want to experience it. Um, it's, it's really not the other way around. This is another great quote by um, the infamous uh, Albert Einstein. We cannot solve the problems we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we, when we created them. So 
this boils down to the level of self-awareness and becoming so conscious and aware of the thoughts that we're thinking. It could be in the moment or it could be reflection that if we wanna overcome an unfavorable or challenging situation or experience, simply we have to, I call it, wipe the Vaseline off of our lenses and choose to wanna to see things differently. That's one of the lessons in A Course in Miracles. It states, I want to see things differently because when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. It sounds so simplistic, it is, but yet it takes a concerted effort and a level of self-awareness in order to sort of do that. Um, again, we're gonna be you know, reminding you a lot of the, these great quotes that come out of A Course in Miracles. And one of them is, what is not love is fear and nothing else. Now, these principles are so basic, but oftentimes they're so elusive because we don't recognize or aren't fully aware and conscious of how when light is, is cast on darkness, it completely illuminates. And that is what love can do. Um, and you know, whatever you think is causing your unhappiness, it always comes back to having a root feeling of fear. Let me give you another example. I was having a conversation with, um, it was actually a client yesterday. And, you know, we were doing a little bit of excavation and exploration. And I asked the question, you know, what are you concerned about? The details are irrelevant. And his answer was, well, I'm afraid that. I said, okay, hang on a second. Whenever we have a thought, now it causes us to have to be aware of what we are, what, what our thoughts are telling us. When he was about to say what I'm afraid that, he was looking at things through the filter of, through the lens of fear. And I said to him, okay, well, you know, it, it's, it's gonna be near to impossible to sort of uh, um, solve your issue or overcome that challenge if what you're focused on and what is taking precedent in your mind is the fear. So, you know, let's look at it from a different perspective. So again, you know, it, it's, it's self-awareness and recognizing what may be our unconscious or conscious thoughts, if it's steeped in fear, looking to determine what is it that will return me <laughs> to a more optimistic or uh, favorable uh, thought or emotion. Um, let me pause because I know I'm doing a lot of talking and it's hard for me to, I don't see the chat. Amber, any comments or questions coming through or any points that you want to raise before I just keep motoring through? Yeah, well, I, I, I thought it might be a good time to open up just for a question, just because um, this is a lot to absorb when you're, especially if you're not as familiar with the Course in Miracles, but I know we have quite a few folks who are uh, familiar with the Course in Miracles. And so um, I think this will be a great time just to open up and ask a question um, and based on what you just talked about with love and fear. Uh, and so one of the questions that we have posed for you is given what we discussed last time and what we've discussed just now this time, where, and this is for anyone who's on who may want to use the chat or unmute, where do you believe that you may have been acting out of fear instead of love? And so while you get that answer together, I'll give you uh, just my experience. When I came to the work of A Course in Miracles, that was such a profound realization that actions come back to being rooted in fear. And I argued with it for some time. I said that, well, I wasn't afraid. There's not, I wasn't afraid. But the root feeling of fear can manifest in so many different ways that it, it, it's not a conscious, it may not be a conscious fear where you're afraid of what is happening, but afraid of what's behind it, afraid of what it means, afraid of what it feels like, afraid of what someone else thinks about you, afraid of what will happen if you don't do something. And so when I really started to look and examine my actions in different situations, I would, I would, I would put that, I'd look through that lens, is this love or is this fear? I recognize that it is, it, it's like how, the universe breaks down to 
positive pluses and minuses, atoms and protons and neutrons, all these things that like we break down to our, the root uh, issue and the root issue really to me became apparent that we do, we act out of love and fear. And so now I recognize that and that's always my gut checks gut check for self. So um, so just to open up the discussion to others who are on, is there any way, did this resonate with you in any way? Is there any way that you may have been acting out of fear that you had not recognized was in the root of fear? And if you want to share, you can unmute or we can save some of our conversation and keep going uh, and have a more robust discussion and get to it towards the end. I'm guessing that some of you may still be processing this and thinking and going, huh. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is also like a, a coaching hours. Michelle and I are both coaches. And so if there's a question that you want to pose or if there's a situation that you may have dealt with and you're trying to grapple with was that out of fear or love or how could that have been then feel free to bring that up as well absolutely yeah yeah okay. so we'll keep motoring along but please you know ponder the questions because we want to hear from you because your story is our story um and collectively you know this is a safe space um anything that you know we can learn from each other will help to catapult us um to having better life experiences because life is gonna throw curveballs at us, but it's how we react to them that again will determine for us um, the kind of life you know, we're gonna have, which is an excellent segue to this quote, um, what we think we become. In every moment of our lives, we're creating our lives. And you know, it has gotten to a point where as we become so present to what thoughts we're thinking and how relevant they are to what then emotions will, will come as a result and what experiences we'll have. When we wake up in the morning, this is the most important time of the day because when we wake up, we have a choice about what we wanna think and potentially set an intention for how we want the rest of our day to go. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, well, certainly before COVID when we would have meetings to attend and an office potentially, or any kind of work environment to go to, you know, we are sometimes on automatic pilot. And, you know, now we may only have to commute to our office, you know, somewhere in the house. And yet at the end of the day, what is so important is that when we wake up to the best of our ability, silencing our thoughts or getting present to our thoughts to be able to ask our higher self, what's the intention that I wanna set for today? So that whether it's the alarm clock didn't go up, didn't go off, um, I was late to that Zoom call or, or you know, whatever can set our day and distract us, if we set the intention that we want to kind of return to love, we don't necessarily have to have that experience derail us and cause us to have a frustrating day so that by the end of the day, you know, we are feeling overwhelmed and stressed. And literally, if we practice that kind of on a moment to moment, day to day basis, we can take those days that become weeks, those weeks become months, and those months become years, and we are creating a favorable, if not miraculous life, because the life conditions aren't determining what our emotional state is. We are determining what our emotional state is, and that's really what it's all about. And that's the ultimate act of self-love is loving ourselves enough to prioritize ourselves in the morning, put ourselves first and ask ourselves, what is it that we need? I know one of the uh, other things that I love from A Course in Miracles is the waking up and asking yourself the question or asking the universe, asking God the question, where do you want me to go? Wh who, where, what is it? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Who do you want? What do you want me to say and to whom? Mm -hmm. And I've made that a practice of asking myself that in the morning. And I believe it really opens up the universe. It opens up our day to expanding. And instead of, um, instead of uh, worrying about getting things done, it, it, it leads us into 
it leads us into our day feeling as if, you know, things are in divine order and it's going to be okay. And I'm going to get as much done as I can having some compassion for myself, but knowing and having faith that you're being guided in your day and your steps is that like a part of what we're discussing is like, how do we improve our relationship with ourselves? Well, we improve our relationship with ourselves by improving our relationship with the source, whatever source that is that we connect to. And so I, I, I feel that that is just truly the ultimate act of self-care, mm -hmm. self-love. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it boils down, you know, um, folks to our thoughts, you know, and we go through this life, as I mentioned, sort of, you know, 90 miles an hour, nine times out of 10, we're on automatic pilot. And we, until we commit ourselves to practicing presence, aren't really familiar with our thoughts and the power that our thoughts have on our life and our emotional state. Um, you know, again, I love this image. A lot of the pain that we are dealing with is really only our thoughts. It's, it's we don't have to believe everything we think. When we talk about improving our relationship with self, I'll bring up again, another example, having a, a conversation with a friend last night and she was grappling with, you know, just a lack of self-confidence and our conversation surrounded with, you know, when I, and I was trying not to coach her, but yet, you know, that's kind of part of my DNA because her story is my story. And I certainly have times in my life and moments of my day where I just lose my confidence. And what we were exploring is what are the thoughts that we think that will compromise our confidence? And, you know, we were kind of having a good, good conversation. And one of the things that she was present to is, you know, I, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel deserving. And what we explored was, well, is that the truth? You know, we talked a bit in January. I think we made reference to um, another thought leader. Her name is Byron Katie. And she has this model called The Work where, you know, she takes us through a series of four questions that when um, addressed helps to eradicate pain and suffering. And one of the questions is, is it true? So when, we're, when we want to, from an internal perspective, even an external one, become aware of the unfavorable, negative, um, depleting thoughts that erode our self-esteem, that erode and compromise our confidence, we should question the validity of those thoughts. Because nine times out of 10, what we have not discerned is that those negative thoughts are coming from our ego not our higher self. Now, there's a whole nother conversation we could be having about the role the ego plays, but it's important for us to recognize and separate and decouple the conversation <clears throat> that our ego has with us versus the conversation that our higher self has with us. Because anything that is negative and depleting um, is our ego. And when we can get to the point, it may even appear to feel like it's, uh, we're schizophrenic or even bipolar, right? Because we are decoupling and separating ourselves uh, enough to be able to say, okay, what was that thought I just had? And again, you know, if it's an unfavorable thought that's depleting, do not go with it because it creates neural pathways. The more we think a particular thought the deeper that belief becomes, and then we see it realized in our life, right? Um, so again, you know, don't want this to be too heady, but we want to put you on the path of recognizing that every thought we have, not only about ourselves, but about others, does not always have to be believed. Questioning it um, is a way of separating it and saying, okay, wait a minute, is this my ego telling me an untruth or is it my higher self returning me to love? I just want to pause because I can't see the chat and I just want to make reference. Anybody have any answers to the question that Amber just posed? We, kind of, we want to hear from you, 
ladies or gentlemen, if there are any men on our call today, be brave, unmute, talk to us. Adora made a comment in the uh, in the chat, ex accessing and moving toward goal confidently. Adora, did you want to expand on that? I was hoping you were going to say something, Adora. <laughs> I feel like I'm in uh, my executive coaching session all over again. <laughs> so um, just to what you were saying, uh, Michelle, uh, our ego gets in the way of uh, probably more to my comment. How do I move toward my goals? The goals are laid out. They're documented. Um, I see a path forward. Um, but to the emotion you mentioned earlier, fear, fear of, uh, well, will I really accomplish what I've written out? Is it too lofty? Is it too big? Um, and it's not that it's not accessible. Uh, it's that internal emotion of putting me aside, putting my ego aside, wondering, well, what will people think? Will they think this is all about me? Or will they really see my heart? Mm -hmm. through the vision of what I believe God has given me to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for me, through prayer, um, I believe that I have written out what God has given me. And so um, putting aside my ego, mm -hmm. my thoughts, my perceptions, and just moving forward uh, toward that. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Yes. And, and, and again, I'll say this over and over, you know, your, your story is our story. You know, we all have goals. It could be professional or even personal goals. And to your point, you know, there's usually, especially if we're stretching ourselves or if we are going in a new or different direction and those goals are pretty lofty because they're unfamiliar and, and it's uncharted territory, our fears and doubts can be so pervasive that it causes us to procrastinate, stagnate, right? And, and the antidote for that is one step at a time, right? And it sounds so much easier said than done. However, all we have to do, I mean, you're a perfect example because boy, I mean, you just inspired me throughout our coaching engagement with how much tenacity, perseverance and resilience that you demonstrated in keeping your goals at the forefront. And even despite the fears and perhaps insecurities you had, it was taken, you know, not eating the elephant whole, but eating it one bite at a time, right? Because that's how we create miracles in our life. It's not believing the thoughts um, to the point where it causes us to pause, but let me move in the direction of my goals because moment by moment, you know, uh, inch by inch, we start to see the realization of that goal. And the other thing that you said that we can all relate to is how crippling the threat of other people's opinions of us are, right? We put so much emphasis oftentimes in, and, and focus on what will people think? right? And something to be said about it, because boy, oh boy, we're living in this world, and we are not an island, and we want to be accepted and loved and appreciated and all that good stuff. But trust me, you know, we're going to embark on situations and do things that, you know, may be downright polarizing by people, or they just may not understand. And there was something that I read recently that said, and it was referencing kind of a woman, there's nothing more um, uh, powerful than a woman who does not care about what other people's opinion of them are. Now, it's not just relevant to females, it's relevant to all of us as human beings, uh, because there's something to be said about other people's opinions of us are really none of our business, because mm -hmm. our opinion of other people, and even others' opinion of us, is really not about us. They're seeing us through the filter of their lenses. And sometimes what they're noticing is, I wouldn't do it, and therefore I don't think she or he should do it. Or it didn't work for me, therefore I don't think it's going to work for the other person. So there's so much projection that encompasses, you know, opinions that, again, when we get present to um, either 
our projections um, and opinions of other people, as well as the impact that they have on us. We got to clear that debris to the point where it says, you know what, they can have what, whatever opinion they have. But if I am sure that my purpose and my intention and my acts are with the best of intentions, that's the only business that we can own. And it then, you know, fuels us to, uh, you know, achieve the goals. So yeah, thanks for sharing, Adora. Yeah, and that definitely takes a lot of practice. Uh, we have a comment from Kathy in the chat. My thoughts now are to stop processing the past and to do the steps that are being discussed in this meeting. Kathy, I just wanna invite you to um, share more on that if you like. Okay, so, um, so from the last meeting that we had, um, I did a lot, a lot of the um, stuff that you said, the homework. Oh, so Kathy's referring to the vision board workshop that we did this Sunday, just for those of you all who don't, who are like, what meeting are she talking about? Okay. So yeah. your homework steps, the morning success routine we talked about, that was one of the steps. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I said that um, to stop processing the past, um, which means that um, something that um, uh, Michelle said earlier about, um, I think she said to think about what you have now and what are the good things you have now to move yourself forward. Mm -hmm. And I, before the um, vision board meeting, I was very angry at um, what was happening in my life for the last 10 years or over 10 years, very angry, but um, the vision board uh, meeting was very helpful. Mm. And um, so now I realize that I have to stop processing um, who did that to me um, and to realize that I do have a friend. Um, my, my problem was that I wanted to get married at, um, I'm in a certain age that I'm, I'm not a, ch a kid. I'm not a kid at, at this point. And um, over 10 years ago, I was, I was 31. So that is where I'm getting the, I needed to get married and I wanted to get married. Um, so that's what I realized. I realized that, um, Stop processing who did this to me, whose fault it was, and um, to process that I do have a special friend that has been acting like a husband in a way and who is very positive and has helped me to, in January, um, push myself forward to smile more at people and as a result of because he wrote to me happy 2021 with a smiling face he sent it to me in a text message told me that he's a positive person he's easy to talk to um and I need to do that smiling face with everyone like every um young uh, man that I know or that I'm meeting right now, to be um, positive, like to be aware that a, a negative comment on Facebook could hurt someone. Even if I didn't mean it that way, it did hurt someone and it put me into a very bad situation with that person. So to move forward in 21, in 2021, um, this, I have to be very mindful over, I have to be mindful over how I am um, saying things online, mm -hmm. on my social media, and even in person with other people that I've, I'm meeting now. Um, and to stop processing the past and to start doing what you're saying now which is um, the things that you started saying in the meeting was what I have to do. 
So Kathy, I want to, so, I, cause you make, there's so many points Absolutely. that we we'll talk about and what you say, and I'm so glad that you brought this up. One of the things I want to just start with is the, when you say to stop processing the past, I want to encourage you to look at it as to stop getting stuck in the past. Processing is healthy. Processing is a part of what helps us to understand. And instead of pushing feelings down about the past, if you stop processing and you don't have an understanding, then it's really still going to creep back into the foreground. If, if you don't get to the bottom of things, or get to at least some level of understanding where you can move forward. But I think that a part of what I'm hearing you say is that what the vision board helps you to do is be pulled by your love for, for the future instead of getting stuck for your fear or grievances in the past. And so I think that that is, um, and, and I'll ask you if, if that resonates with you, but I think that could be a part of what the activity of division boarding did for you is it opened up the future. And, and instead of looking back at what happened in the last 10 years, instead of looking back at what was done wrong, it said to you from this point forward, I'm going to move in this direction. Yeah. Yeah, Michelle, I, I wanna, so so I hear, yeah, that that resonated and I know I see Michelle nodding. So I know that that she wants to add as well. So um, Kathy, I just love when you, you, we had a great conversation with you in the vision boarding session on Sunday too. So thank you for bringing this up because I'm sure that there are a lot of people who are who who are dealing with some of the same uh, challenges. And so Michelle, I just want to invite you to weigh in on what Kathy said as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself, Amber, and you're absolutely right. Processing is healthy, right? Because, you know, we can't go through life <clears throat> with kind of putting blinders on or not at all kind of reflecting on things that happen. And again, in support of what Amber just shared, uh, Kathy, what I want to add is everything that happens in our life <clears throat> happens for a reason. And nine times out of 10, because everything, whether we believe it or not, is, is divinely intended. So here's, here's the takeaway that I want to kind of um, gift you with. As you're processing the past, and this again goes back to what Amber was saying, reflect on what you learned about yourself what was positive. Now, it may take a bit of effort, right? Because sometimes what's so pervasive and so prevalent is what went wrong and what mm -hmm. hurt us, right? <clears throat> but yet, when we really practice mindfulness, <clears throat> we can cause our processing to be, I've got to and I want to find what was the benefit? What did I learn? Because that's why it happened. Right, it's, it's, you know, um, it, it's, it's intended, all of our experiences, although on the surface, if, if it was not uh, an outcome that was ideal, you wanted to get married 10 years ago, it didn't happen, but possibly the experiences and the quote unquote delays in finding a significant other <clears throat> was because you weren't ready to be the kind of wife that you wanna be. And now with the right processing, you can begin to commit to who do I want to be and what relationship, you know, do I want? Um, it may not be what I don't want because whatever, whenever we go through an experience, sometimes what is born from that is I know what I don't want. And when we know what we don't want, then we know what we do want, right? So, you know, I hope that that wasn't too convoluted, but it's, it's yes, reflect back on the past that's healthy, but extract from it what was advantageous. And you may have to spend some time because again, what may be on the surface is all the stuff that went wrong. And the other thing that I'll leave you with <clears throat> before I go forward is we're never a victim. <clears throat> we may be victimized by situations, but there's no power in seeing ourselves as a victim. So whenever our ego causes us to think, why me? The higher self says, why not me, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, you know, again, we need to clear the Vaseline off the lenses and recognize that we are more powerful than we may think. And subsequently, every experience that we've encountered um, is not going to take away our power unless, of course, we allow it to, okay? Mm -hmm be a victim or a creator, you can use those, those experiences to create the next level, to create 
positivity to create uh, learning or wisdom that we can pass along. So just, I, I know Michelle, you're moving on, but just to say to you, Kathy, uh, I love that you said uh, about the emojis or, or the happy faces on your timeline and what I recognize in that and want to presence you to is that you're choosing to move forward in love and not fear. You could let what happened in the past help me make you hurt people. They say hurt people hurt people, right? But instead of that, you're being mindful and aware of the energy that you're putting out there. So I just want to celebrate that you're moving forward in love and not fear. Um, Robert, can I gotta, say one thing? Yes, yes, sure. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I, I just want to say to Kathy that the number 10 has been kind of a thread, the number that's been going through my life, uh, most of my life. You mentioned 10. My 10 is 57 to 67. And I lost my job at 57. And I did not know that I was going to be searching for who I am and what I would be doing next 10 years later. So in between, I considered my job loss. I got to a point where I considered my job loss a divine intervention. And then I looked at everything that happened uh, I looked at all the positive once I got past the negative and then I started, I believe I started realizing miracles once I surrendered to my higher source. And so, you know, you start out thinking one year with no work, two years with no work, but you never think that you're going to go 10 years. So I just want to say you're not the only one who's experiencing a 10 year growth and um, I guess a reinvention and a reevaluation of who we are, I've gone through that process too. I'm so glad you added that, Venice. That is, that's inspiring and in, in seeing the way that you've processed and looked at your situation uh, and recognizing the value in it, where you could be the victim and you could say, this happened to me and, and instead looking at what a blessing it was and how it's ushered you into the next phase of your life. Yeah, and I did. I did go through the victim. I did go through all of that. But you That's have to work through response, that. Right? Huh? That that is the natural response. Goes why me? That's what yes. our, our jerk reaction. But then yeah. our higher self. Then uh, we can lean into our higher selves to really get the full experience of the why. Like when we ask why does something happen, and what do we take from that? What is the meaning in it? Mm -hmm. And with what, you know, Venice, you shared and what Kathy's story reminds us of is, um, you know, we, we, there's so many things to pay attention to as we are learning how to be present and be in the moment. And, and it's our thoughts, as I mentioned earlier, but it's also our feelings, right? Because our thoughts create our feelings or also known as our emotions. And when we want to return to love, when we want to have a miraculous life, sometimes the litmus test is, how am I feeling? You know, there's something about women's intuition, right? We all have it. It's not just a female thing. And the intuition is sometimes this feeling, this, this gut feeling that sometimes we don't even have evidence to point to, but it's a feeling. And if it's anything less than I call it favorable, happiness, bliss, joy, gratitude. If it's unfavorable, overwhelm, stress, fear, <clears throat> that is the time to pause and say, hang on a second, I need to process where these emotions are coming from. What are the thoughts that's feeding those emotions? We wanna starve those thoughts. We want to cancel, delete, replace those thoughts because when we want to return to love, it's not just going to happen in an instant. We've got to do a little bit of tracing and retracting to be able to identify what were the thoughts subconsciously or even consciously that I was thinking that caused me to feel angst, worry, and literally practice um, how we can overcome it in an instant by telling ourselves the truth, right? And not believe the perception of what, you know, uh, we may have encountered. So yeah, thanks for sharing because those are great examples and we can all relate to them. So I put up here, these are, you know, the additional two questions that we wanted to pose was we've got, you know, another 10 minutes and, you know, this is where, again, we want to hear from 
any of you who kind of want to share your story or answer these questions. And the second question is, what if any grudges might you be holding on to that prevent you from realizing the lesson and seeing the blessing um, in any situation, whether it be with losing a job, um, having, you know, a, a breakup, you know, sometimes we hold on to grudges. Um, so yeah, just throwing that out there if anyone chooses to comment on that question. I can, I can quickly share that I've over, I've had some bad things happen, uh, you know, getting fired from a job or having somebody throw me under, under the bus that I had asked to be a reference for me for a job and I didn't get the job because of something that they said and I never found out what that was. Um, those things happened, but what I realized is that, I mean, I'm not holding any grudges against the people that that did those things i i've been able to move on and i think only when we can move on from that do we open ourselves up to really what the what the universe really has in store for us and what it wants us to do so maybe i was on the wrong track and it's not really where i was supposed to go but we're we're gonna have awful things happen and i think for us the most important thing is to make sure that we don't hold those grudges. Oh, this is juicy. All right. I've got to say this to you. And I kind of want to set you on a different course because there are two things that you said that I'm sure Amber picked up on and, and our coaching ears. Uh -huh. You said, I've had some bad things happen. I so, know better. <laughs> huh? Yes. So what I want to offer you is just things are happening. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't want to disrespect you, but it's bad is a perspective. Mm -hmm. Things happen. So returning to love, experiencing a miracle starts from, am I giving meaning to something that happened? There's, there, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Of okay. course, in miracle says bad things don't happen to good people. Things just happen to people. Right? So we want to take the judgment, the opinion, the evaluation, especially if it's unfavorable, out of the equation. Because when we're even trying to surmount bad things happen, now how do I overcome a bad thing that happens? It's like, wait, hang on. Let me just look at something happen. Losing a job. Mm -hmm. These are all these quotes that, that I pick up and it resonates. Rejection can often just be protection right? Because losing a job was divinely intended. Now, life's going to throw curveballs at us. But when we know that everything is in so divine order, that losing the job was intended to put you on a different course. Now, it hurts because it may not be certainly what you wanted. It's unexpected. The timing is completely off. But yet, when we can look at it, face it, be present with saying, I'm not going to call it bad. I'm not going to call it bad. You may have to affirm that, you know, on a day to day, week to week, month to month. And for you, it lasted 10 years. And yet to, to release the pain associated with that 10 year gap. And even this relates to you, Kathy, it's, it happened for a reason and it takes as long as it takes for perhaps us, you, to find the right path. Um, so, so again, it goes back to no bad things happen. Things are just happening. And that shift in and of itself can hopefully allow us to um, accept the reality as it's happening. Because again, when we say bad things happen, why? That puts us in victim mode. And then we got even more of a hurdle to try to overcome as opposed to just saying, okay, this is happening. What is this, right? What am I supposed to learn? It, it puts us on a more um, balanced um, uh, platform so that again, you know, it, it, it does not cause us to have regret or resentment. But thanks for sharing. Hopefully that helps. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to lose that three letter word. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> yes. take, take the judgment away from it because that's going to yeah. take you out of love. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 
So we have a, a question from Christina in the chat and Christina's at work. And so she may not be able to speak on this, but I just want to bring it up. So she says, grudge parents favoring other siblings, often declaring me the strong one. And then she follows up by saying, what helps you release the pain? And so I'll, I'll take a stab at that uh, and then pass it to you, Michelle, and to anyone else that wants to interject as well. Forgiveness, processing, Goodness. accepting and forgiving. And that doesn't look the same for all of us, yeah. but um, I dropped in the chat the Byron Katie, the work. Byron Katie uh, and the, the work really does help us to look at uh, to, to get an understanding where we're able to forgive and to take so much of the emotional sludge off of what's happened uh, in our lives and to get to the core of what we need to accept it and to let it go and move forward. So, you know, it's not um, bad emotions aren't bad, quote unquote, emotions aren't bad. Negative emotions aren't bad. They, they, they presence us to our feelings to what we need to what's happening in our lives it's getting stuck in this negative place is what doesn't serve us well and so again just to uh add to what we said earlier that it's it is very safe it is very healthy to process what has happened and sometimes what helps us with that is allowing ourselves a time frame to grieve to say i'm going to be upset about this for this long. And after this, I got to let it go. Like just recognizing at what point does it no longer serve us? Is it hindering us? Is it taking away from our happiness and our joy that we're still continuing to let our parents or our exes or whoever, whatever grievances we have in the past hold power over our present and our future? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in terms of letting go of uh, how to release the pain. Michelle, do you want to uh, add to that or do you have any anything? Yeah, to I do. I do. Yep. And, and I'm just um, echoing everything that you just said. That's why I love working with you because it's like, you know, we're on the same page. Um, so I just want to offer a thought um, is you may want to pose the question to your higher self. How can I see this differently? Mm. It goes back to the quote, that I referenced, you know, the solutions of problems cannot be solved with the same um, mindset that created them. Okay, so when you're reflecting on, you know, the grudge, the pain that is caused from your parents, um, um, you know, preferring your siblings over you and kind of seeing you as this as the strong one, there's some pain that you've associated with that thought. And yet what we're inviting you to do is, again, ask your higher self, how can I see this differently? Because it's only the lens that you're seeing it through that is providing you pain. And I'm going to suggest it's really not about what your parents are doing, it's how you're interpreting their actions. And you may not have an immediate answer to that question, but that's okay. When you process that question or ask your higher self, the spirit in you, at some point, it's going to be illuminated. There's going to be a, um, a, a, an epiphany, a bit of an aha um, that will help you to Amber's point, not only quote unquote, forgive them, uh, uh, but it's an inside job because it's not so much what they're doing, it's how you're interpreting what they're doing. So it's changing the lens to how you are seeing um, what's happening and how you're interpreting what's happening. You want to be able to find out you know, how you can kind of switch that around because they may never or ever, or I don't know, in a short period of time, change that behavior. And you don't want to be conditional waiting for them to change it so that you can feel appreciated. You want to be able to get to a point where you're seeing things differently that either it doesn't bother you what they're doing or by nature of how you are neutrally responding to how they treat your siblings, it causes them to stop doing it because you are so powerful. We don't realize that, again, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change, and subsequently, you know, your interaction with them um, could create a miraculous, more harmonious dynamic. So that's my two cents. Amber and Michelle, uh, is it okay if I share um, on this one? Um, yeah, I'm considered the 
Yes. I'm considered the strong person in my family. There were eight, eight of us. Um, I'm third to the youngest. Um, yet was considered, and still is to this day, considered the strongest. And over time, as I've had conversations with my siblings as adults, they can look back and see, one of my sisters would say, now I can see why mom always made me do this because she knew that I wasn't good with my hands. And so by her asking me to do this, now I'm very effective with my hands, but she couldn't see that then. For me, I don't think I felt uh, ever that I was left out. And what I realized as an adult was I was a thinker. And so often thinking faster um, and wanting to engage more than what my siblings were and still do to this day. So the way I interpret that is they didn't feel that I needed as much of their attention or the nurturing. Um, but what I did need is um, I, I asked a lot of questions. And so that time I spent with my mom, I was asking those questions that I needed her to answer for me without me going in because of the way I think. I will fill in the answer if you don't tell me what the right answer is. And so learning to ask those questions as time went on. And so that has helped me. And so I don't have that feeling that I was left out of anything. I just recognize that I see the different skill sets in each one of my siblings that my mother and my father took time to nurture so that they could be their best selves. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Adora, uh, Christina says that she's listening. She's grateful and she's in tears. She's striving to see this experience differently. So Christina, we just are grateful that you showed up to receive this. This is exactly where you're meant to be today and now. And thank you for Adora for adding to pouring into Christina. Mm -hmm. So we're just at 1.30. That time flew by so quickly. It always does. There's so much more that we could say, but we're so grateful that you all joined us and just want to remind you that this is part two of a three-part series. We actually have Miss um, Nicole on with us, who's not able to unmute now. She's got a lot going on in the background, but she'll be joining us as we conclude this three-part series next month, uh, still talking about these universal truth principles that we can apply to our work and our personal lives, our personal and professional lives. Um, so we'll be really putting the principles into action action. So we've talked about them. If you are familiar with the work of Brene Brown, she has that list of the 10 things uh, for authentic living. And it's like, let go of this to, and cultivate that. We're going to do that kind of style thing with A Course in Miracles, what we need to let go of and cultivate or what we invite ourselves to let go of and cultivate to move into our highest, best, most amazing, expansive selves <laughs> for 2021 and beyond. So that will be on uh, March 3rd, I believe, mm -hmm. the first Wednesday in March at 1230. You can re-register with the link uh, that you were sent for this. Go ahead and register for next month. Share and tell your friends, please. Uh, you're also able to watch the replays. I think that link should be there. There's a place to watch the replays on this. And uh, if there is anyone, we do, we we don't, we don't, uh, request we don't we don't require but we always uh, receive and appreciate donations so if you feel so moved as to give a little donation you can do that on that page as well but please watch our replays share them with friends these conversations especially amongst us amongst women in the safe space we just really are passionate about doing this work and hope to do more of this if you work with the organization and you believe that we could bring some value to your organization with these type of conversations we're also available uh, Michelle and I both are coaches Michelle's an executive coach. I'm a business coach. I coach. I do life coaching as well. And we have workshops and programs uh, that are tailored to the specific needs of organizations and schools. So you know how to reach us. Uh, but Michelle is into actioncoaching.com. And that's I-N-T-U, actioncoaching.com. And I'm quartzwellnesscollective.com or my name, amberlyforrester.com. All right. So Michelle, do you want to say anything else before we close? No, just ditto. <laughs> 
<laughs> this, these conversations are just yummy and they certainly help me shift and get out of my own way. So, you know, we're just grateful for all of you who show up and, you know, our mission, honestly, collectively is we want to heal the planet, but we can't do it until we heal ourselves. So, you know, let's embark on that um, so that, you know, we can make that difference in the world. Together. Yes. Yeah. All right. All right, friends. We will see you next month, if not sooner. Be well. Take care. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, mommy. <laughs> <laughs>